Today is Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024. Damien, what's on your mind? I'm tired. I'm tired. I've, I've been writing at night. And but I've been writing. I mean, last night I was writing from 10 p.m. to about 12, 12.30 a.m. And then I went to bed. And then I woke up at five to go running with my wife because uh, we are um, self-important, impressive individuals. I'm pretty tired. But no, it's, <laughs> no, because I, um, I don't get to see my wife otherwise on weeks where she has a schedule that she currently does. And she set a mandate for me. What a one, one of the albatrosses that sits on my back uh, every day. Uh, for the past 15 years. So I've been trying to finish a novel. I've been trying to finish a novel, but instead I've finished grad school, had two kids, <laughs> survived COVID, and started a law firm. And can never quite finish the novel. But I'm hoping with you here, and with this new creative uh, energy that we have, um, that I can channel that into finishing. So I'm tired because I got four hours of sleep, but my energy's up. Uh, uh, uh. Up, up, up. So what I want to talk about today, what's what's really on my mind, is the parable of the farmer and his horse uh, from ancient China. This is this is a very common saying in in, in China. It's it's, it's a it's a cheng yu. So cheng yu are usually four character phrases in Mandarin Chinese, and um, and they they contain within them uh, a whole lot of wisdom, and they're usually or often. I don't know if usually is the right word, but often when I studied them, when I studied for my master's in Chinese studies for University of Michigan, go blue, you concentrate an entire story, which itself was packed with wisdom into, into four characters. So in this in this case, Farmer Sai lost a source. Sai Wang Shi Ma. Sai Wang Shi Ma. And the story goes like this. Farmer Sai, he's a millet farmer, and he works very hard for a very long time to save up money to buy a workhorse goes to the market one day, buys a horse, brings him back to the field. But that day, after the day's work is done, the horse runs away, essentially taking away years of hard-earned wages. Friend says, that's terrible news, uh, friend Sai. Uh, it's terrible news, you worked so hard and you've got nothing to show for it. And Farmer Sai says, could be good news, could be bad, you never know. The next day, Farmer Sai is in his field and the horse comes back and the horse brings with him a friend. So now there's two horses. And his son says, Father, this is tremendous good luck. Now we have two horses. We can, you know, just, just come increase our holdings, increase our yield. This is good news. And Farmer Sai stoically says, you know, son, I don't know. Could be good news, could be bad. They have two horses, so the horses, both horses can't work all the time. Their field is not big enough yet. So the farmer's son uh, starts uh, riding the horse around. And one day the son falls off the horse, badly breaks his leg. He's brought back to the house and he's talking to his father. His son says, father, you were right. Getting a second horse wasn't good news. I might be a cripple forever now. It was terrible news to you know, have this horse be brought into our home. And the father says, you know, we don't know. Could be good news, could be bad. And then the emperor turns out is uh, wanting to go to war. And he comes and collects all the young men in the region. But because the father's farmer sized son is crippled, he doesn't go. All the men in the war die, the son survives. And ultimately that's where the story ends, right? But at no point in these events, did you know what could happen? And so I'm thinking about that because we are in, uh, in, in many ways in this world where despite having the greatest set of communication tools we've ever had, by greatest I mean both their number, their power, uh, the sheer insidiousness of some of them, right? They literally change our minds like these loading social media screens. Despite all of that, we still tend to catastrophize. So we see events unfolding in terms of this is our greatest hope and this is our greatest end. Hmm. The list of subreddits that we have online, which are devoted either to say we're going to have an economic collapse or, you know, the Tesla truck is the greatest thing to ever occur or the Tesla truck is the worst piece of garbage known to man. Hmm. I mean, that list is pretty long. It's either horrible 
or it's amazing. Either we have hope or we're gonna have you know, in a president, or we have somebody that's gonna bring down the Republic. One thing in uh, immigration and in, in, in a lot of other fields that's gained traction as that is, is something called Project 2025. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh no. Have you heard of it? I, I Only by name uh, and marginal, get, marginal notes. Get this, it's 2024 right now. Yes. This project is next year. Okay. So 2024 doesn't have to worry about this project. But Project 2025 is going to define 2025. You see, here, here's what it is. It's a Heritage uh, Foundation document, several hundred pages. And in it, it says exactly what some number of people are going to do if Donald Trump becomes president again. And it has very specific plans, which I guess makes it interesting for media and social media and whatever, but the reaction is along two lines. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen. It's gonna destroy everything. And, uh, oh, this is amazing. We're finally gonna see the uh, dream of the Heritage Foundation and its conservative allies realized. And I have to admit, I am in neither of those two camps. If you watched our podcast, uh, 10 Billion People with Marine Able last week or watched the last Any Given Day episode, two episodes ago, I talk about this idea that we, we mistake how human systems actually work and that we think that they work, but in fact, nothing works, nothing works. So, so when, you, when a new law is passed, there's a new constitutional interpretation by the Supreme Court or a federal court or a state Supreme Court, when a new regulation is promulgated by one of the many agencies, the human assumption in this country and in other places perhaps, but particularly in this country, is that that new interpretation is going to go atop a working rational system. But that's not the case. In reality, an interpretation of a law or a new regulation that's been created or a new law that's been created is created by people who assume, like economists and policy wonks and other academics, a rational state, a working state within a system, an industry, an administrative agency, a market, whatever. But in fact, they're creating something um, based on false pretense because that whatever doesn't actually work. And so then what you get in effect is a fantasy document, a fantasy regulation, a fantasy Supreme Court interpretation, a fantasy law, meaning they're based on fantasies, and you layer it on top of something that's not working. And so then you get Something that's very dystopic in nature, right? Something that needs fixing, but the fix that's come actually doesn't address anything of what's actually wrong. And in fact, ends up making things worse, more costly, more complicated. Which means, I think, that you shouldn't worry about it. I'm certainly not going to worry about it. Do you know why? Because the only thing that's gonna matter at the end is the reality on the ground. Let me tell you, let me tell you my own story uh, in my life where, where I bought a horse. I was in eighth grade and my homeroom teacher uh, was a very uh, prominent member of our middle school. He was the athletic director. He would visit your classes in science from sixth grade forward and everybody knew they were like, we wanna be in uh, Mr. J's class when we get to eighth grade. He was the science Olympiad instructor and I was a big science Olympiad guy. Uh, he was a Cub Scout leader. He was the football coach. He was the assistant basketball coach. He was the medical trainer. I mean, this guy loved helping kids. And uh, a lot of kids, I, I, I think, really had a high opinion of him and his c colleagues had a high opinion of him. I had a really high opinion of him. I admired him. He was my homeroom teacher in eighth grade even. And on the Science Olympiad project, you know, we, 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 I, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. He taught this curriculum on DNA. Specifically, he taught a curriculum on, on, the, on a book on the discovery of DNA written by Watson and Crick. Uh, who would, two scientists who would win the Nobel Prize um, for their co-discovery of DNA. And Dr. Watson was still alive at the time we were learning this unit. And I, and I took a book from Mr. Jones's class in eighth grade and I read it and I liked it so much I didn't give it back for years. And I felt guilty, you know. You should, that's stealing. It's stealing. And it sat right next to my six copies of The Great Gatsby. <laughs> <laughs> six copies. All of which I'd stolen from the high school because I kept on forgetting my copy and felt no guilt about. Uh -huh. 
I felt no guilt about those. I couldn't even tell you who taught those courses, but I had six copies and then the, 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 the double helix was called the book and it just kept me awake at night sometimes. I got a chance for redemption. Uh, junior year of high school, I'm taking biology too. I didn't want to take AP biology uh, because uh, I didn't want to work that hard. I didn't want to work that hard. And I took biology too, which is more fun. It's hands-on. The teacher was like this awesome hippie, let's call her uh, Miss, Miss, Miss K. And Miss K said, I have an opportunity for five biology two students to uh, go listen to Dr. Watson speak at UNC Chapel Hill. You might know him as the co-discovery DNA. I was like, I know him. Oh, I know who he oh, is. Oh, I know who he is. I know who he is. And uh, so, so I went and that day I was wearing something typical in high school. I know I was wearing rainbow flip-flops, you know, like the rainbow flip-flops. And I brought along a uh, Kodak one-shot camera. My good friend Laurel was with me and we sat in the front and there were, to be honest, a bunch of elementary schoolers, middle schoolers in like our junior year high school class. There were like five kids. I think there were five spots that ended up being like three or four kids. Not a lot of interest in watching the discoverer of DNA, you know, give a lecture. I sat at the front and I had my book and I asked the organizer, I said, after Dr. Watson's done, I'd like to get this book signed. And he kind of like shushed me. He's like, oh yeah. Yeah, but it's just like, I was like, okay, but I mean, you're gonna let me do it. And he was like, yay, it's just, I was like, okay, but I'm gonna do it. He's like, you'll have to wait for me. I'm like, cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it though. Hey, just so you know, I'm just, gonna do this. I'm just gonna never do this. And like, <laughs> Dr. Watts is already old. He was probably in his eighties at that time. And he, he gives the talk and he takes some questions and then they rush him out. And we were, we were in the basement. Of, um, of a building that's that's right on Franklin Street. You're on the basement and they rush him up one of the two sets of stairs that came down to this place where they'd set up a, a table for him. And I look, I'm like, I'm like, look a betrayal towards the organizer. He looks at me, he like shrugs. And I look at him, I'm like, I told him to do it. So I take off my rainbows, take off my rainbows, put them in one hand, I take my book, I give the Kodak camera to Laurel. And I'm like, catch up to me. I'm gonna get this book site. And I run outside, he's already like, 120 feet down with his two minders. I'm ru running bare from like, Dr. Watson, man. <laughs> hey man, Dr. Watson, man. I need you to sign my book. And you might not know this about Dr. Watson, but he was famously, um, famously loved attention. Uh -huh. And so he turns around, he's in a gray suit. His hair is like out to here. And just this big English, uh, smile with 73 teeth. Just, Which is unusual for a British person. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was jumbled. And the two people were kind of looking at me like weird, just making sure, but they, yeah, I'm not. I was all of 165 pounds, they weren't scared. He signs the book, long story short, signs the book, shakes my hand, Laura Humble comes, she's barefoot, takes a picture, and I have this awesome picture, Dr. Watson, and I go and I give the signed book back to Dr. J at the middle school. Mm -hmm. Total redemption. I met a Nobel Prize winner with one of the most significant discoveries in the history of humankind. DNA changed the world. And I've given it back to this community leader, middle school icon, who everybody in you know Chapel Hill went to our middle school like, knew and respected. That's a perfect story. I feel great, I feel great about myself. I have the picture on the show. It's junior high school. My sophomore year, Dr. Watson comes out publicly with some very racist views on what DNA actually is. You see, he says DNA proves that uh, there's racial superiority in the white race oh. versus all other races in, in terms of intelligence. The Southeast Asians are the smartest and then he tells us who thinks things are the least smart and uh, it's super racist. I mean, it's like, a, it's like that filthy eugenics racism. And so now half my story shot. I actually, I didn't run down a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> I ran down a virulent racist to give this back to my poor teacher. But then a shocker in the front page of the uh, News and Observer the uh, local paper of record. Dave, uh, uh, Mr. J, I almost said his real name, arrested in a sting operation. He's on his way to a uh, 
14 year old boy's house with a digital camera and uh, two tubes of lube. Two? And a two. Whoa. One, everybody gets one. Wow. And some condoms after a, a long, long, uh, you know, uh, operation which showed that he had been, you know, texting and trying to- uh, Solicit? Trying to solicit, thank you, to minors from the school. So now my story is I ran down a racist I ran down my favorite racist <laughs> so he could sign a book for my favorite convicted pedophile. So you never know. A farmer loses his horse. A young American high school junior misses his big chance with his pedophilic homeroom teacher. I... Could be lunch meat, could be peaches, who knows? Damien, I'm left with a question. Yeah. What happened to the six copies of The Great Gatsby? <laughs> <laughs> I still got them. <laughs> I still got them. Those never went back. Those never went back. They didn't keep good track of those. Why tell this story? I, I tell this story because Project 2025, it's a project for how 2025 is going to be shaped. So it's a project for how millions of lives are going to be impacted by regulation and laws by probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of other people in power and semi-power and quasi-power working towards some conceived goals. I mean, some are conceived in detail, some are not so much detail. That's a lot of cause and effects. Nobody knows how it's gonna pan out. I'll remind you that the farmer lost his horse and that this guy accidentally, not knowing, ran down a racist to get a book signed by a pedophile when he thought he was running down a Nobel laureate to get a book signed for a very loved and respected teacher. The most consequential immigration legislation of the past 50 years was the 1965 Immigration Act signed into law by Lyndon B. Johnson, 89th Congress. And nobody knew that it would change America's demographics in as drastic of a way as it did by eliminating country quotas, by eliminating de facto racial quotas. It really ushered in modern day America. Modern America is more brown, more black, more diverse because of that 1965 act that thought that was thought to be just this side act to the main pieces of civil rights legislation enshrining the rights of African-Americans in this country. Nobody knew what it was gonna do. So Project 2025, if enacted, could end up ch changing the very being of this country. Or we could all just end up with broken legs. That's what I'm thinking about.